Welcome to another Studio Q. This is um, half obviously our Christmas special. It's our last show for the year. Mm. And we're being a bit literary this week. So joining me are some regulars that you'd all know quite well. Harriet next to me. Um, the consummate Mr. Alan Duncan next to that. And Mark <laughs> down the end, huh? who you've probably seen in Mr. the last Roy. few weeks, reviewing this, that and the other. But first up, we are going to go to a little bit of footage. Uh, we went to the opening of a book at Reading's in the last week or so. It's called uh, The Park Bench by Mr. De Sousa. Von Sousa. So Henry Von Dusa. Von Dusa. Dusa. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, but anyway, we're going to go to the footage and have a little look. And we'll talk about it when we get back from this. Daniel turned away. He looked in the other direction, over the back fence and down the street way down High Street towards the city. Looked past what we tried to hold on to by our last move, which was, I think, move number four. Almost one for each year of our lives together. Stuff in storage in the Flemington lockup, stuff in the shed in Adelaide, and the clothes and club chairs in the Fitzroy lean-to. Lives in transit and spread too thin. Once he turned, it was only a short way through the parks of Fleurfield and North Fitzroy, across Alexander Parade, back to the pubs and clubs of the inner city. It was only a short way from Preston to Collingwood. It didn't take long for Friday night to come around and for me to reappear. I stood with a stivy and a glass of beer, me leaning against the carpeted walls of a reliable club, perhaps in the groove I'd made years before as I waited to, for Dan to walk up and offer to buy me a drink. Perhaps in a furrow that foresaw my return and was waiting, kept warm by a man who, for the moment, was away taking a leap, buying another round, or, if he was lucky, following a dream and a hardening dick back to Doncaster and South Vermont. Away from the grey haze from cigarettes and the smoke machine. That's what the nightlife depended on. The booze, the drugs, the porn on the monitors behind the bar. Cheap titillation that padded out the time we spent trying to find each other. And we're here at Reading's bookstore in St Kilda for the launch of a brand new local gay novel, Australian gay novel, a bit of a rarity. And I'm here with its author, Henry Van Dusa. How are you going? Yeah, very well, thank you. Did very I pronounce excited. that right? Well, there's Von. <laughs> Van's um, Dutch and Von's German. So, oh, um, OK. Heritage, so a V-O-N. Right. And the Dusa was perfect. Excellent. Good perfect. stuff. At least I got part of it right. <laughs> so it's a big momentous occasion for you, I guess. Your first full-length novel, yeah? Yes, it is. Yeah, I've had um, some short stories published and I've been writing um, some theory, you know, my master's degree. But yeah, first um, full-length novel. Okay. Okay, and you did your master's on beat culture, didn't you, mm. at the University of Melbourne. Mm. Um, how did you come to um, get interested, well, excuse me, how did you come to get uh, interested and involved in that line? Um, well, I've worked around, um, around beats um, in some of my paid work, which was um, way back um, in, I suppose, the early 90s for VAC in, um, in northern New South Wales, okay. in Coffs Harbour. So oh, I worked right. as a beat outreach officer up there, which was... Quite, and I'd just come out and I didn't really know much about beats at all, so I had to go down and work around the park where the local beat was, which was so much more than a meeting place for sex in a rural mm. environment. It's where it's where life happens, it's where gay life happens. Well, there wouldn't be many other contact points up there, would there? There weren't. No. I think there was one night once a month in a pub that didn't last long, so, you know, the local park was the place where on a, on a sunny night people went and met each other and, mm. you know, for sex and so much more. I wasn't running after something I'd already been chasing for five years. Too tired, been bruised and hurt enough already without adding feet to the list of damaged goods. <laughs> Him in the car, spinning wheels and spitting gravel in a way that reminds me of fun back home. Donuts, burnouts, circle work in the old ute my uncle had on the farm. Dan's car twitched when he grabbed the bitumen, left a couple of S's and was gone. Daniel was gone. I, did I see correctly you're from South Australia originally? Yes, I am. Yeah, I grew up in the Adelaide Hills and spent a good deal of time there and then we've travelled from there and I live in Melbourne these days. You came out there? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I came out and then escaped. And escaped. And then we're as back. You do, as you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So can you identify with any of that rural stuff from your own coming out? Um, yes, I can. I mean, I grew up in Adelaide Hills, which back then was sort of rural in its environment. It's not now, but I think just the isolation of a rural environment is something that 
whether you're living in the city, in the country, whatnot, that isolation is something that mm. um, people that are coming out or haven't yet come out experience and can identify with. And so yeah, that, those, those themes are definitely important themes in the book. Okay, yeah. and that's um, the principal theme of the book, isn't it? Uh, is it sort of from, is it based on any sort of like case studies or um, anecdotal evidence from your work in the, uh, the no, counselling? No, not area? really. It's just based on my um, own experience, people, my friends' experiences, my work life, just yeah. what I hear around little snippets that have, you know, I worked for a long time at the Edinburgh Castle in um, Adelaide, oh, which is yes, a gay yes. pub there. And that's sort of where I came out, which was quite precious in a way that I got to come out yet still be safely behind a bar at arm's length in a certain way, you know what I mean, it was, it was good. So you know, I've just heard, I've been around gay men a lot, okay. you know, it's my life and... Were you yeah. in touch, there seem to be quite a few queer authors coming out of Adelaide now, have you had much sort of association with the writing scene over there, like you've got Mel Keegan, the queer sci-fi author, what's, oh, okay. what's the go with Adelaide, is it fertile ground for authors or what? It must be, well <laughs> Stephen King said something about, about Adelaide, couldn't wait to get out of Oh what did he <laughs> say, good place to write a serial yeah, novel yes, or something? Yes, yes. Yes, exactly. So that must be what's going on. No one in the street, or working, or shopping, or having a life. Only the sun and number seven looked on, and I could care less about them. The other flats dormant, dead as, which was a relief. Sex and fights, the two things you never wanted to hear in a group of flats. The two things that made me cover my ears when it was someone else, but which I, in the middle of, couldn't keep to myself, couldn't hold back. Sex and fights travel between the thin brick walls, the threadbare carpets, the ceilings. When they happened, people sat up and noticed. More than anything, more than the smell of someone else's cooking food, or the loud gurgling of an old Holden being fired up and left to warm up under the window on an early cold morning. This is what I remembered about the strangers who lived around us. How a sudden burst of noise could make me uneasy, angry. I sat down on the steps. Everything I could have done different was running through me. I lit a stivy. The sun caught the smoke and made it thick and blue and extra heavy. Maybe all the shit they say is true. Between being shaky and beside myself, I knew I was running out fast. Like my used by date was looming, and any moment soon I'd be marked down and shipped out. Do you think there's enough gay literature coming out of Australia these days? Um, there, there seems to be, you know, there seems to be some coming out, and mm. and you know, I don't think there probably is enough. It's hard to get gay fiction published, and I've been lucky that it's it's um, Thompson Walker that have published this novel. Are not a gay publishing house. They've just picked three new authors to set up this imprint, and um, and I've been one of them. So I think that must be a sign of something because it's a pretty edgy sort of work I don't shy away from the sexual aspects and it's quite brutal in a certain way so and Thompson Walker haven't shied away from that so they were receptive either. from the word go yeah? yeah very much I mean I I sort of sent in the manuscript and it's all been go from there Do you have any particular role models in a literary sense that you've uh, you've read and thought hmm they like the style and try and emulate or oh well what can I say one of well, literary sense, Sandra Bernhardt has always been marvellous. I love the way she writes, you know, in that for, for many reasons, but I like that she writes in snippets, and that's something that I tried to do in this, is write in a way that emulated loitering in a sense. There isn't a clear narrative, and it's just small moments, but, um, you know, Christos Solkos is really inspiring. When I lived in South Australia and read, you know, a Melbourne author that was writing about the streets so much and in such a gritty way, it made me just want to come to Melbourne and be in the streets and be around what he was writing about. Okay. <laughs> mm. no, it's good to read about your own streets rather than the streets of America or somewhere yes. else, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. The sun's on my back and doing the sun on my back and me doing a Dorothy with my feet. I clicked my heels and on the counter three was still there. A half circle in the gravel made by my heels is like the start of a love heart or the wings of a bird flying. I dragged on a study and ditched it in the grass. Daniel was gone for good. Do He'll be one to watch, I think. I think the park bench, it's one, one that you could go out and get, and it's um, it's not a long read, it's certainly, you know... It's, but you can do it in a couple of nights. I mean, yeah, it's uh, out hard. from Thompson Walker Publishing. That's right. An imprint of um, Scholarly Publishing Australia. So, well worth a look, I reckon. I do indeed.
So if, have guys, have books been a big part, being growing up gay as we mm. have, have you found books to be like important to you over the years or like a... Very much so. Yeah? Yep. And like in New Zealand, we had a, a um, New Zealand author that brought out a very gay book. Yeah. And it was the first gay book that I brought, uh, The Blue Lawn by William Taylor. Oh. And it was very enlightening. It was a terribly written book. <laughs> but it was short, which was the great thing. But it was my first look at gay life in a little town of 3,000 people. So, wow. it was so what's, the, what's the premise of the story? Well, uh, two boys meet, fall in love, and the grandmother sews a blue lawn. That's the As premise of do, the book. You know, we always blow... S what? Blow a... <laughs> <laughs> You might have read a couple too many of these, I think, Harriet. <laughs> Was that Freudian, my dear? <laughs> well, I want a blue Don't lawn. Know. Okay. Oh, so that was a local New Zealand author, was it? Yes, very famous local New Zealand author. No, who, what's her name? Who, William Taylor. Did people, knew that, did people know he was gay or did he bring this out and then, oh. Ironically, we're not sure if he's 100% gay or not because he has been married and has kids and he's never actually come out. But he has written a couple of gay novels to teen for teenagers. Oh, yeah. Because it's not really the sort of stuff that you can make up, is it? Like, like this book, The Park Bench, it's... You can tell he had to be. You can tell he had to be on the inside, as it were. What about you? A lot of research went on. <laughs> when you were a kid, was I like your local gay rag the Catholic News? <laughs> well, Sorry. On, ah. on waters that Thin run that have just parted. <laughs> no, well, for me, I mean, I grew up in Kings Cross, so I didn't have to read. Books. Didn't have to read. I, mean, I just saw it in every day every day going to school coming home and um, really I didn't know I was going to be gay at that point in time mm. like a lesbian or anything like you know but I had an inkling that these people were my people. Have you, you know? got something that you want to share with us and I'm meaning a book? <laughs> Do you mean this one? Yes because we're actually only here for a short time not a, you know. <laughs> hint hint. So what about the rest I of your life? pronounce his rude. name. Chris Distelkis. Chris he's, big, he's big at the moment, isn't he? He's had two, three novels out. Well, he yeah, wrote, head on. He wrote the book that Head On and loaded. was based on, didn't he? Yeah. But look, I have not read any of those books. I heard him on Joy being interviewed, then I heard him on the ABC at Margaret Throsby's uh, program mm -hmm. on the ABC FM. And I, during all that time, I was reading this book. Now, this book is a cross between mythology, um, a journey of a photographer going back to Europe from his Greek roots in Australia as a gay man and travelling around, sort of revisiting the places he's never really seen before. Revisiting the places he's never seen. As an <laughs> Australian Greek man. Because, <laughs> because no, I'll tell you what, that, see they always make fun of me. And I know what We're I'm saying. We're laughing with you. Revisiting <laughs> meaning, he already knew it in his heart, in mm. his sense, in his culture, in his DNA. But he didn't know it in a practical, physically, physical sense of travelling over there. So he found out that in his family there were ghosts, there were also vampires, there were people in his family tree and friends and relations that he hadn't met before and when he did he found that they were pretty decadent. Mm. And you've read it haven't you? I have read it and um, unfortunately my views aren't quite as good as Harry's, or Harriet sorry. Um, Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tea at the end of that. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm not. I'm not a tea person. Look, this th this book is. It took me ages to read it because it was so profound, dramatic, sad, really sad. That um, and I was going through a little bit of a sadness myself. So it just escalated everything that was going on. But it it, it resonated. It would resonate with but anyone. Did you, did you think it was a real? It was, was it believable enough that you thought he was actually making a journey? Yes, definitely. And he was like also an internal journey. He was also not internal, but also external, physical journey. He was a photographer, so he took photos of everything ah. that he experienced. And it, it happens that when he develops his film, mm. he sees something else in his photographs. And that's for you to find out in this book because that is the leading situation. So if you do that? read it to the end and find out, because you may fall asleep, I do apologise. 
just because <laughs> you write in first person does not mean that it's a good book. I don't like first person. So is it mainly usually. the style that you didn't like? You know? The style, the plot. I picked it up thinking it might be scary. The mythology might be interesting, and unfortunately, I found it very lacklustre. But and it's very a lot of people. You must admit that. It's a bit pornographic. Boy, is that descriptive? Especially the the <laughs> man on woman scene. <laughs> Oh, oh, the straight sex part will be done. Oh, yeah, we'll don't get that. There. Now, but we've got to move on to book. the next book because we're so. only here for a Goodness. certain amount of time. Harriet. <laughs> Mark, what have you been reading? Okay, I just wanted to point out Chuck Paulinick. He wrote The Fight Club. He's a fantastic author. Um, if you pick up anything of his, it's going to be fantastic. I went into the gay bookshop uh, down commercial road and asked them I want to find the gay Chuck Pulinick because he writes so brilliant and he is gay. Great writer. It's very raw, funny. So is it related? fiction, non-fiction, what are we talking? Yeah. It's um, okay well ironically non-fiction is about non-fiction. <laughs> Choke. It's fictitious, very funny about a man who gets money from people by choking himself at restaurants oh, and his new one Haunted. 23 short stories in a novel form. Not as great as the rest, but very funny. Are they gay short it, stories? Bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. They have a sensibility. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I started off, of course, being a sci-fi fan. I found solace in my little Doctor Who paperbacks as a kid, but moved on yeah. to more queer-related sci-fi in the adult sort of realm. Um, you've got Simon LeVay, who's actually the guy who discovered the theory of the hypothalamus in the brain being smaller in gay men. Ah. And he's written, this is his sort of classic all bricks gold. What Not does brilliantly the hypothalamus do? Um, it's in the brain. It uh, controls your like, Hormones drives and, and all that sort of thing. Oh. And they found that gay male, the gay male hypothalamus is a different size, more akin to straight women's size. And is that's that a speaker? Are we worse drivers? Straight you straight stop straight delaying the show any more than it's already <laughs> over time, Harriet. That's his um, thriller, All Bricks Gold, delving into that whole... I'm glad um, to see you also got that on special. I did. <laughs> knocked down. Did. Knocked down. Knocked down. And, and quickly. Uh, there's a local Australian sci-fi slash fantasy author called Mel Keegan. He's from Adelaide. And he's written both historical queer fiction oh. and futurist science fiction. Okay? I would read that. It's actually a really good read, East Wind Blowing, set yeah. back in Roman times. And it's passionate, it's raw, it's full on, but actually quite well written. Well, okay? that one. Um, and David Gerald, of course, he's actually a well-known American. He's a Star Trek author. He wrote some of the scripts of the original Star Trek series um, on the TV series. And he's written a series, Jumping Off, Jumping Off the Planet, um, which is actually has gay characters and looks at a future where sexuality is selectable. All right, we do have to go now because we are over time. But once again, thank you all for viewing us here on Studio Q. No worries. And we've we've got, got another bit of footage coming up for you are. now. It's a bit of a story about uh, the City Library, which um, stars Alan and Harriet put together. So it continues our bookish theme for the indeed. last show of the year. Uh huh. Last show. Merry Christmas, y'all. Have a good one. We'll see you around. Around. in 2006. Bye. You may think today that we're here in an art gallery, but in fact we're in a library. Don't believe me? Well, we're actually here at the whiz -bang New City Library in the Melbourne CBD. It's been a momentous project for the, uh, the Melbourne City Council over the last couple of years, and we're here with its big boss man, Peter Fraser. How are you going, Peter? Good, thanks. Good to hear. Glad to have you with us. Now, just before we get into the, the library side of things, um, how did your personal journey bring you to this vocation of, uh, of public libraries? I think, um, to be honest, it was partly because I always loved books. Mm -hmm. you, you're not meant to say that these days, but... I but think so. the, the, the book stigma is lessening, isn't it? Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> um, that was part of it. And the other thing, I think, is the pleasure of people who have a passion of some mm -hmm. sort. So when you have someone come in and they've got a passion for... Well, I remember in the library once having someone come in with this throbbing cardboard box and he was after books on pigeons, you know. So oh, because really? he found a pigeon in the street and oh, the library was the spot yeah. to find stuff. Yeah. So but people can have a passion about absolutely anything mm. and you can always find something that mm. will help them, whether it's in your own library collection mm. or on the internet or in another library. Mm. So I think it's that, meeting people's passions. We are here on Ben TV, of course, looking yep. at the, uh, the gay community in particular. Do you see any particular um, appeal in libraries to the gay community? Um, I only think that 
the fact that the libraries have material for gay and lesbian communities. Mm -hmm. um, we made that part of our setup collection guidelines that we wanted to have a good collection. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the library, it's really like, um, I really don't see it specifically as a distinct group because mm -hmm. um, gay and lesbian people are not just interested in gay and lesbian issues, they're Indeed. interested in everything. Indeed. So our job is to provide whatever people want and gay and lesbian people need whatever everyone else wants mm. but they also need collections that are specific sure. in fiction and non-fiction yeah. and so forth and we have good collections in those areas. Have you delved into the area, it's been a bit controversial, but things like kids books with GLBT themes, that's caused a bit of a stir of late, what are you, what's your position on we've, that sort of We've thing? got some children's books about people who have multiple parents, multiple families, multiple yeah. locations and we've got books about people who are trying to see what their own identity is. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we have that. Okay. Mm. Um, another group within our community, if you like, GLBTI, that is sometimes underrepresented and uh, ignored maybe are the older demographics. Um, and older people in general do use libraries. Yeah. Would you have anything to say to people of that demographic who might come in not being 100% comfortable in maybe asking for materials of a GLBT nature? Yep. And, you know, what options do they have? Computer catalogues or... Mm -hmm. or yeah, I think there'd be a few things I'd like to say to people who feel nervous. Um, one is that libraries, uh, the whole purpose of libraries is to provide people with what the people want. So part of that is, you know, we're tax funded for a start. Well, this library is not so much tax funded as CAE <laughs> and City of Melbourne funded. But um, we're funded to support what people are interested in or what they want to learn about. So for a start, they have a right to expect a public library and this library to provide information that they're interested in or to help them find it. So that's what we're here for and the staff love doing that. Mm. So generally people who work in libraries love helping people and they're trained to um, respect all people no matter what their yeah. values are compared with their own values. So there's a values thing in the library that would help. Another thing would be um, that once you've found one book in a location because of the way libraries are yeah. set up there's likely to be other books in the same location but the other thing would be um, choose the librarian that you feel comfortable with mm. you know if you don't feel comfortable choose someone that you that looks like they would um, make you feel comfortable in asking them something. What, what are some of the other slightly unusual facilities you might have here? Uh, well this is the gallery and at the moment we've got a, an exhibition of cloud paintings by Melchior Martin. Mm -hmm. um, we try to have paintings by inner city artists if we can um, this is also used for events, mm -hmm. um, so there's going to be, um, the Midsummer Festival has an exhibition in here next, early next year. Mm -hmm. um, there's a piano down at the end of this gallery and we let people who have some level of skill in playing the piano and are prepared to play softly play <laughs> that at um, set times of the day, wow. usually around lunchtime or the busy times of the day when it's, there's less need to be quiet and people actually love that. We've got a beautiful big seminar room uh, where we have lectures and people can book it for mm -hmm. events and again there's something early next year in the Midsummer Festival that's being launched in that seminar room uh, and this is launching Queer Street in in the um, seminar room. There you mm. go. So remember mm. that, look out in your Midsummer Guide to Queer Street happening right here at City Library. And yeah. Peter, it's certainly been great talking to you today yeah. and thanks so much. Okay. And the message we're getting across is don't forget your local library. If you want a bit of queer content, books, videos, DVDs, come into your local library and they're all for free. Forget all this paying business. <laughs> yeah. cool. Peter, thanks so much. Thank you.